I'm James King and this is Mary Nye. Great to see you. How are you? Very well. Congratulations as well on, on such a, a, a powerful film. Um, it premiered last September at the Toronto Film Festival. Yeah, that's right. And obviously you've screened it several times since then, on several interviews since then. How much have you found people coming up to you after the film saying, this is my story, or this is my friend's story? How much has it resonated with people? Um, yeah, I think uh, I was quite surprised even when we were editing, because we would hold sort of uh, little friends and family screenings in an edit, and um, just to see what was making sense, what wasn't, etc. And even after the very first one that we did, um, one of my friends was in floods of tears in, in the audience, um, and couldn't speak to me afterwards. And I, I she just said, I'll text you, and ran out, like, well done, I'll text you. Um, and then it turned out that one of her close friends that I didn't know had been through something similar. And I think we, we had two screenings in at TIFF in Toronto. We had the big gala, which was really exciting, but we did a separate screening, which was for public. And three people came, I just came to do a QA and a like this. And as I was standing waiting to do it, um, just afterwards, three people came up to me. One was a woman probably in her late forties, I think. Um, and she was crying a lot, so I she couldn't really speak to me. And then she just said, I liked your film and I thought, you know, she's going to say a nice film, whatever. And then she went, I'm a clinical psychologist and um, and I think the film will save lives. Um, and I said, well, thank you very much. And I felt quite emotional. Um, and um, and she just she just went up, she left shortly. She was still crying. And then um, an older man, I suppose in his 70s, came up to me and he said, uh, I think it's really good that you talk about the friends because we had a friend who was in a marriage like this for years and no one did anything. We, we didn't know. We didn't know that what she was going through, so no one did anything. Um, so I think it's good that you speak about the friends. And I said, well, thank you very much. And then there was a very young woman there who was um, a student, I think, and she was crying so much that she couldn't really speak. So I said, um, do you want to sit in the front row? Um, so she sat in the front row crying for a bit, and uh, she said, I just know so many women in this situation. Um, and then left. And that would have been part of the reason why you wanted to make a film like this, to, to get the message out and to help people, ultimately. Yes, totally. I mean, uh, as uh, one podcast pointed out, there are no car chases in this film, so it is not for everyone. Very important. But, exactly. But, um, but I think that, yeah, I think we all felt that um, this kind of abuse isn't really, uh, there aren't many movies about it, and all of us hoped that it might be useful in some way for people who to understand it, for the general public, but also if you're going through it, or if you've got a friend who's going through it, um, or when I was casting, one person told me their mother had been through something like this. Um, so, and that's something I found throughout the making of the film as well, was I, I had never experienced anything like this, but um, I found like heads of department, uh, people who are working on the crew, people in post-production, men and women, would say, my dad really, that Simon really reminds me of my dad, or uh, I've got a friend in this situation, or I was in a relationship like this. And I don't think it's, a lot of a lot of uh, people imagine, I think, that it's always women, but actually a man told me about his experience in a relationship like this. Um, so yeah, I think it's quite, it's much more widespread than I realized, certainly. Talking about the making of the film, I, uh, I looked at your Instagram feed, today, Mary, and uh, certainly it's worth looking at if you want a little insight into, into making the movie. Um, and this one was from July 2021, so I think you just wrapped the shoot. Uh, yeah. And you said, got through bugs, rain, electrical storms whilst actors were swimming in the lake, and I got trapped in the boot of a car in 40 degree heat, and I think they planned on keeping me there. <laughs> and we did so many scenes each day. So there's quite a lot to unpick there. Um, it, it sounds like it was, it's obvious really, but it sounds like it was a, a tough shoot, your debut feature. Yeah. So uh, what were the biggest challenges, would you say? I would say the biggest challenges were time. We shot it in 19 days. Um, we shot 14 hour days, which is actually not legal in the UK. Um, it's, a, it's a North American way of doing things. Um, I would say also COVID, we were doing it during COVID. I was, when we flew out, um, we were 50, there were 15 people on the plane. I had to be deemed an essential worker in order to go to Canada. 
um, which was stretching it, you might say. But um, so so we, so we got there, and it was it was uh, it was just trying to get cram in all the scenes every day, and also as you were always doing when you're shooting. But I think also because of the emotional nature of the material, I was very lucky in that the actors were very robust. Um, lots of them had experiences that related to the material, but I found them quite amazingly resilient um, because we were shooting an enormous amount, and sometimes it was quite difficult material. Um, I did get stuck in the boot of a car. Um, it wasn't intended, I don't, that's what they told me. Um, it was very hot, and uh, uh, luckily, I, I, my, they were trying to work out how to open the boot, and I just climbed through to the front and got out that way. So, so, yeah. so I was gonna ask what, what you think you learned making the film, but I guess not getting stuck in the boot of a car would be one of the lessons. Number one, or if yeah. you're Anna, don't get stuck in a lift. Right. She at Toronto, she got stuck in a lift and had to be rescued by firemen. So um, maybe this is all a plot. I don't know. But um, no, don't get stuck in things. But also, um, I think uh, we had to be quite guerrilla in how we shot it. And it, in some ways, because of the the time element, um, I think we all came up with quite inventive ways of getting things done. Um, and even though we had a big movie star. Uh, and we were financed by Lionsgate, um, we still had to be super resourceful. So I think that blend of quite indie filmmaking, but also with these you know, incredible elements like Alan and Kendrick as the lead, uh, that was quite a lesson. Because sometimes I had to front things that were difficult to front, like, um, please can you get back in the lake? And <laughs> we're gonna shoot this scene with the camera in a fish tank because we don't have any camera gear, please. Um, and Anna would always do it, so I was very grateful for that. Let's talk about casting her then because it's I think it's a different side to her that we haven't seen before actually which is one of the many great things about that performance a mesmerizing performance um, how did you two meet and how did you get to work together um, we we have a wonderful casting director who I believe is here tonight Alice Sibby um, and Alice uh, and I spoke about Anna Kendrick for the role because we both felt that she's such a clever actor I'd seen her in Up in the Air I'd seen her in A Simple Favor Scott Pilgrim um, and just, I think sometimes people will imagine that if you're a comedic actor or if you're really good at singing, it might not translate to drama, but my feeling is actually being really good at comedy is very technical, it's very hard. Uh, in many ways, uh, coming to drama, I don't know, I, I don't see why that would be a barrier. I think it would probably only be a strength. Um, and I knew from watching her up in the air, she can do drama. Um, so we wrote her a letter. It was sort of, you know, pie in the sky. Um, I wrote her a nice letter. Um, an actual letter or an email? Um, a letter and an email. And um, it went to her agents in America. And very quickly they read the script and then sent it to her. And very quickly she responded. And we had a two hour Zoom. Um, and she mainly wanted to know where the story came from and um, to talk to me about my approach. And I think she was quite keen to make sure that I wasn't going to try and make a sort of lifetime movie version with you know, guy beats girl, girl gets away. She, she was, we were talking, one of my references was The Assistant. And we spoke about how in that film, um, Harvey Weinstein is a voice and a, a, he's an absence more than he is a presence. Um, and the, your understanding of what the situation is very gradual, even though that's a very famous story. Um, and Anna said very early on, I think it doesn't matter if some people don't get this film because the people who will get it uh, for them, it will really resonate. Whereas if we turn this guy into a monster, uh, it won't be relevant to anyone. It'll just be a sort of made up, not another made up movie. She said, I wanted to get inside the experience of questioning yourself. And I know that that is one of the reasons you were so attracted to this as well. But how, how do you achieve that? How do you discuss with her to actually get to that point where you feel you've got inside someone's head? Well, I think it's about trusting um, your actor to an extent and that the performance from a performance point of view I believe it's about believing that your actor has a very readable face and that if they have the thoughts they will appear on camera um, and I think a lot of Anna would sometimes ask me you know I'm not sure this is right or I don't know if you know and I would say really you need to believe in what you're doing it's fantastic and um, a lot of it was just about trust I think and bonding with the other actors which we did in the rehearsal days leading up to the shoot in terms of the filmmaking, I think the flashes and those moments where you go into her mind, um, I'm, I'm, I've always, I love novels, I'm, I love trying to dramatize somebody's interior life. And the flashes were something that we knew would evolve. So the screenwriter, Alana Francis, 
didn't write them really. She, she sort of gave me green light to shoot the material I needed. And I had a sh kind of shopping list of material that I wanted to get. And I would often get the actors to do versions or do the same scene, but to give me a different version. And then in the edit, the uh, editor, Gareth C. Scales, and I really worked on the language of those because I think audiences are so smart. You have to be very accumulative and very gradual in how you reveal what's happening to her. In the original draft of the script, the friends all knew what was happening to Alice. So the minute they get to the cottage, they kind of confront her and say, you know, what's going on? And what we realized in the edit is that you can't do that because that's kind of it then, the movie's finished. You have to have the audience understand what's happening to Alice as the friends do, and that's your way in. So, so that changed whilst you were in the edit room? Yes, it did. Um, and we also stripped away quite a lot of dialogue as well. Because it's, it's what, 89 minutes long? And we're in a world where most films are about two and a half hours, so uh, it's very pleasant experience to see something so brilliant that is also 89 minutes long. Um, was, it, was there a longer script than that? There was, is what you're saying. There was a longer version than that. Yes, and I think also tone was quite interesting because um, when Ganya Dia Horn, who plays Tess, saw the movie, which she did just before TIFF, she went, oh my God, Anna's really good. And then she went, oh my God, it's fucking dark. And I think because we shot a lot of um, material that was a bit more like the bar scene, um, a bit more bubbly, uplifting, um, Anna more as you know her. Um, and actually looking at it, and understanding the psychology of Alice and what she's going through, we realized that that just didn't sit well within the film and tonally, if you really follow uh, the journey of that character and also the extremity of what Anna brings to the character with that scene in the bathroom, for example, where she's putting up the, I know there are many scenes in the bathroom, but the one where she's really going for it after the confrontation with Tess, um, you, you need the tone to be consistent and it has to go that way. Um, and it's also, it's an intense little movie, so I think putting somebody through more of it might be unfair. <laughs> There's a wonderful rapport, isn't there, between the three women, between the, the three friends. How do you as a director encourage that amongst the actors? How can you help with that? I think chemistry is always a bit mysterious. I think what you can do is, and what I always, if any, any sort of student directors ask me, I always say, we'll try to get them together before, try to break the ice before. I think um, what helped with the three women was that we were all in quarantine and then we managed to meet just before shooting. We had this day sitting by the lake and we and I had sort of a shopping list of scenes and we discussed them and everybody was quite, was to me, in my English way, I mean, Wumi's English as well, but uh, Ganya Dio is Canadian now, it's obviously American, was, I was quite amazed by how confessional that rehearsal became um, and how much the actors wanted to share with each other about the relevance of the film to their own lives. And I think that built an enormous trust. And I think also, it was quite lucky that we shot all of the stuff at the cottage before we got to Toronto, because it was like a bit, I mean, I've heard crew members and actors describe it as summer camp, because we, you know, everybody was coming out of COVID. We were in this very beautiful rural place. There was no one else around, all the bars were shut. So there, was, there were barbecues at the weekend, people were hanging out, telling each other their life stories. Everyone was so relieved to actually see another person. Um, when we were shooting the bar scene where they're dancing, Anna requested Rihanna, obviously not in the movie, um, and uh, she was dancing to it. And I looked over and the crew were dancing to it behind the camera. And I realized everybody's so happy to be together again. So that was one of the really great things about shooting during COVID. Speaking of music, tell me about uh, Stay by Lisa Loeb. One of my favorite songs. Um, pleased to hear it in the film. How did you choose, was that in the script or did you choose that song yourself? It was in the script. Um, it was a very specific. Very specific, yeah. And Alana Francis, who is half American, half Canadian, said that particularly in North America, that song is massive uh, for girls of that age, women of that age. And Anna was like, loves the song as well. And um, she explained to me that, that that verse, which they go, is the one everyone can't remember. So we put that in. <laughs> Um, I suppose we should talk a bit about your previous directing work and acting work as well, because you've made a lot of short films, haven't you, and worked on, on TV series, so perhaps just give us a bit of background. Um, yeah, I started uh, as an actor when I was 17, and um, very quickly, I think within three years, realised I really wanted to direct, and that was pretty much inspired by working for Sophia Coppola in Paris, shooting Marie Antoinette. And I think it was, I loved her movies, I was a huge fan of Virgin Suicides, um, and I, I, I sort of realized 
that looking at her, somebody that sort of um, calm, patient, observant, uh, quiet uh, female could direct. And I directed theatre um, at uni and stuff like that, but I hadn't really seen a woman, when I'd been acting, I hadn't really seen a woman doing it. So that was a big moment for me. I, I wrote my first short film on that set, came back, shot it that summer. Um, and what then, was that first short film? Yeah, it was a tiny little film shot in my mom's house for about five pounds um, <laughs> with a bunch of friends. But somebody saw it and gave me money to make my second short film, which then got me into the National Film and Television School. Um, and there I, I studied for two years. Um, and after that, I started working uh, in TV um, and was really grateful for that as well. And I think it helped me having worked on, on TV, I did. Um, industry, uh, an episode of the first season, worked on Traces, which is a, uh, a different show, a new show, and it, it really taught me about how to get your hours, you know, how to make a day, really, and how to work with very different personalities. When I got to Canada to make this, I hadn't met any of my heads of department. I had two weeks physical prep. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous. Um, because normally when you do a TV show or a film, you'd have two months. Um, and I think it just taught me to think on my feet a bit. And, uh, and, and you know some of the basics of, of um, the logistics of filming as well. I hope you told Sophia Coppola. Do you know what? So so many people have uh, said to me, you should write to her. And um, it's that old, you know, meet your heroes thing. Obviously, I've met her and I know her. And she actually wrote me a letter after the film. <coughs> but I uh, am too shy to. <laughs> um, listen, we're a bit up against time tonight. So um, I think we're going to end it there. But thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I hope you enjoyed the thank film. Thank you for coming. Thank you.